This is the Digital Trust Podcast. In every episode, we strive to bring support to those of you who serve on the front lines and in the trenches of data and technology. We endeavor to bring understanding to the under-resourced and underappreciated, help remove your stress, and provide relief to your pain. Welcome to the Digital Trust Podcast. Sit down with us as we give you hard-hitting advisory conversations to help you build digital trust with your stakeholders and clients and actionable takeaways to help you become a digitally trustworthy organization. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Digital Trust Podcast. And this is actually part two in a series with Ian Kirby, the CEO of the National Cyber Resilience Group in the UK. Ian, welcome back. Thank you, Christian. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So we left off last time talking about local business leaders and entrepreneurs and maybe them thinking that they're not going to be the next target because nothing's ever happened before. And, uh, you know, cyber criminals are not going after the little guys. They're going after the big guys. Yeah, absolutely. And I think these are you know, common misconceptions. Um, and, you know, if I talk to friends uh, when I'm down at school picking up the family, you know, th- th- these are not just individual to each business owner. These are common misconceptions across general public, I would suggest. Uh, I don't know. Um, some others. So, for instance, everybody's heard of ransomware attacks and you know the big headlines but they are not aware so much of invoice fraud or you know other um, social media uh, type uh, scams um, all of which are designed to extract your data and find an avenue into your business to steal valuable data. And of course, people think, uh, again, in just, I, I just hear this in conversations from um, from small to business, small to medium business owners, you know, that it's super expensive, so they can't afford it. It's not interesting. You, you, you speak, to, you try to have a conversation with someone about cyber security and that you know you can see their face glaze over if they're not in the industry obviously we all go to lots of conferences and we're this is our thing this is what this is our passion this is what we enjoy but if that's not your thing they just glaze right over and it and again um it's it's i think changing perceptions that it's a technical risk it's a, it's a technical problem not a business problem and actually how does it link to income generation and profits and loss etc well you're dealing with smart very capable people right they're they're risk takers they know how to yes. lead and when it comes to the maybe the word cyber or getting into techie elements that maybe they're not an expert in like you say unless they're in industry maybe they don't want to get pulled too much into those conversations so maybe it's the word cyber that's putting them off have you, are you well, finding that? I um, I've changed the way I speak with people now, and uh, at all levels, board you know board levels, all the way down to to real micros and startups, because um, I think this is just risk. It's the same risk that any that you would have on your risk register for any other business. It's it's uh, if you swap the word cyber for risk people start to understand. And if you say the the risk is you could uh, lose income, you could lose reputation, and therefore you could lose your customer base, suddenly it your conversation gathers more momentum. Because you're using risk, which is part of the language of business. So making it more accessible and relatable to business leaders absolutely but of course there's a real fine line because we don't want to uh instill fear into the public and of course there are we see every day there are many other products out there cyber products you know that are sold through 
fear and images with people sat in bedrooms with hood, hoodie, you know, dark hoodies and raining script, etc. Well, you know, reality is different. Indeed. So for these business leaders, who do you find that they typically go to and rely on for cybersecurity help? Well, uh, th there is a, a variety of different um, people they reach out to. Some, depending, again, if they're real micro startups, etc., they will um, reach out to a friend or family, a trusted trusted ex-colleague, trusted business contact um, for that initial conversation. Some may uh, may have an MSP uh, who are already providing their services, so they will reach out to them. Um, however, now, as our membership is growing, they they are reaching out to the police. But again, if we go back to your your question around misconception, there's still a misunderstanding that police can't help me. What you know, the police go and catch uh, car criminals, and and um, you know, they catch real criminals. They don't. They they don't have cyber capacity capability. Whereas through our cyber resilience centre group, we are that. As I say, strategic collaboration between policing and industry. So we are growing our capabilities and and offering that crime prevention advice, which has always been a tradition of policing. Uh -huh. Seems like the misconceptions themselves are a, are a challenge to, to overcome, and that by design, the Cyber Resilience Centers are actually addressing that particular misconception, and that you're able to adjust on the fly and learn and and you know, specifically address those challenges. What what are some of the other challenges that you have found in achieving your strategic objectives at the CRC? Uh, there, there's numerous challenges. So funding streams, for instance, you know, we are funded by the uh, UK government via the Home Office. Um, so uh, when there is uh, other priorities, um, it, it's difficult. We're in a competing market because um, our our governments only have a certain amount of money that has to go around for and there are so many priorities that we are just one of another priority so i think sustainability and long-term funding um, is an issue however what we have shown through our model of uh, collaboration between industry academia and policing again is that those uh, that long term funding sustainability can be supplemented by industry. So that's that's uh, that's an interesting problem. However, uh, one, one of the other biggest uh, problems is kind of around the whole marketing of cyber. And again, not wanting to instill fear, but how do you introduce a behavioral change to someone who does not necessarily understand the threat, want to change, or have the resources or knowledge to be able to change. That completely makes sense, and that completely resonates with me, Ian. Looking at things from a, from a benefit perspective and a, let's say a marketing messaging, what is the win for all the different parties involved? Because it, to me, I'm seeing that everybody seems to be winning here from the universities to the police to the local business owners. So let's start there. For the local SMEs, what's the, what's the win for them? What would you say to them? You're right. It is a win-win situation for everybody. So the win, to answer your question, the win for the, uh, the small to medium business owner is that they are safer, they're more resilient, they have the ability to be able to bounce back quicker and um, continue their business uh, swiftly rather than uh, potentially be completely finished. So, and they have that unique high street connectivity with their local cyber resilience center which is based on their needs and that's why we've kept that regional 
model because it's really important that um, you have that local understanding so we can take the national messaging which let's face it if i'm entirely honest um, people don't connect so well with national government led messaging um, whereas we are taking that messaging we are translating it to a degree and delivering it at that local high street level based on their their uh their local needs so for for these these small businesses they're getting engagement they're getting that local support and they're getting quality help from university students with that oversight that supervisory oversight there at an affordable cost uh, is it it's either affordable or close to close to zero as far as i understand yeah so membership is free to your local resilience center and of course at, at, you are completely right how you've described it there that's far more articulate than than i have but but the key word in there uh is trust so they are getting that uh information from trusted partners such as the police who have always been trusted to deliver uh to deliver crime prevention advice you know we we, we police uh in the uk because the public wants us to police um or the majority should i say there's all but um let's not digress the um so we we police by consent um and we are that trusted brand in a sea of complexity and competing uh, commercial models, etc., we are that trusted brand for free that offer you that free advice, support, guidance, supplemented by the low cost CyberPath services, which are um, in, we can afford to deliver incredibly. Um, incredibly cheaply lovely well we're going to end on that note because we're basically out of time ian but we'll pick this conversation up again in the next episode thanks for joining us ian and thank you everybody all the viewers and listeners for spending your time with us and being part of this conversation thanks for joining us today on the digital trust podcast if you found this conversation helpful please share it with someone you care about and if you'd like to receive our monthly newsletter, please click the link in the description to subscribe. And to put your mind at ease, our newsletter will include episode summaries with key points and actionable takeaways, plus a heads up on the upcoming episode guests. Rest assured, it won't be a spammy sales message and we will never sell or share your information. Thanks again for tuning in and we will see you on the next episode.